welcome to the call. Um, we have a new opportunity, as you will be well aware, um, to extend some experiments that have come from previous open calls. We uh, clearly, in this call, we're going to outline what we're looking for, um, some of the process aspects, and also give you some insights of some of the constraints that we may have to work under in consideration of the, the current uh, lockdown and social distancing aspects. So this in some way may constrain the sorts of things that we can do and the sorts of things that you might want to propose. Um, so, so at this stage, I'd like to quickly hand over to Stephen Phillips. Uh, Stephen, he, many of you will know, is leader of the Work Package 5 around experimentation, and he will provide uh, an introduction to the core. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Okay, fourth open call then, here we go. So, uh, thanks, Michael, for the little intro. Uh, just a little bit more background, uh, in case any of you are confused that we're still here. Um, uh, as you may know, the Flame project was originally just three years. It extended by six months. That took us to June 2020. And uh, to help deal with the COVID-19 situation, it's been extended by another three months. Um, so the good news is that gives us this opportunity to re-engage with partners from the Open Core 1, 2 and 3 uh, to extend the work they already did uh, in a very short time period and do some final uh, experiments on the final version of the infrastructure. So should be good. Um, it's a simple agenda. Um, I've got another slide or so, then Sebastian from Interdigital, our technical coordinator, will take you through uh, just a few limited aspects of the Flame technology stack. But we are aware that obviously you've been in this project before some of you are in the project now on Open Call 3, so we won't spend too long on it. And then there's just a rundown of the three replicators that uh, we uh, are making available for this call. Uh, and then finally, uh, Lamprini from Martel will take you through some of the process aspects, which you can also find on the call's website. So we want you to benefit from uh, Flame. Uh, we've had great responses to the previous open calls, so that benefit is evident. Uh, but we also need you to demonstrate the benefit to the Flame platform, and that's the uh, that's the key thing. Uh, and of course, we need that to to show that the EC that we've done a great job. Um, and so, with the combination of your technology and Flame, yeah, you know, we have to be considering these questions: How is it better than just deploying it in the cloud? How is it better than just using basic edge compute facilities? We don't want to know, oh, yes, I've reduced the latency because it was nearby. You know, it's got to be more than that. Um, how is what you can do in Flame better than your current solution? Um, and we need to be considering the ease of use, the cost, quality of experience, quality of service, and thinking about what your key performance indicators are. Now, this is nothing really very new. I, um, we just uh, emphasize these aspects more and more throughout the project as the platform has got uh, more and more capable and mature. And I would just say that the dynamic adaptation of the platform is key. And Sebastian will talk more about that. Um, again, nothing new for those of you that have been here recently, but the summary of the benefits of the platform are the rapid service provisioning uh, at the edge, uh, service routing to the most appropriate point in the infrastructure, all done automatically and dynamically, uh, rather than uh, the very slow rerouting that you do through standard DNS. Uh, cost reduction for HTTP-based video delivery uh, through um, coincidental multicast of responses. We've got a great service lifecycle management facility to help you orchestrate the services into the right places in the network using very simple templates compared to some other solutions. There's the service control uh, in response to measurements that are made throughout the execution of your service. And the cross-layer awareness, getting information from all the different layers in the stack to make those deployment decisions. So these are the benefits that Flame offers over and above uh, competing solutions. And in thinking about what you're going to propose, uh, it's being able to take full advantage of 
and measurably demonstrate those benefits uh, that we're really looking for. And that's my last slide. So in the agenda, uh, we need to go over to Sebastian. And presumably, I need to do the handover. Um, just to note, I should have put uh, there's, there's time for a few questions right at the end of the uh, right at the end of the agenda. But uh, after that very brief introduction on the focus of where you need to be looking, let's hear a few words on the uh, technical aspect. Sebastian. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh... full screen. Yes. No. Oh, yeah. Great. Oh, sure. Thanks. <clears throat> so, um, so you've all worked with us before. So there's no reason to uh, start from scratch about you know the proposition of our platform and um, what Flame offers to you. Now, one one thing we have learned from especially Open Call One and Two was essentially the uh, the need to guide you a bit more how to. Uh, quickly explore the benefits of the platform to understand them in order to use them and demonstrate the benefits um, in your experiment. That's what we call the design patterns. Just to essentially go back to what, what Stephen just presented, um, those, those aspects, the slide you have seen before in the webinar for the open call you eventually got the, um, your, your funding from. But Essentially, the the aspects of service provisioning, routing, cost reduction, lifecycle management, they are all they can be all demonstrated through certain behaviors, which you can enforce through the the way you design your service, the way you um, define triggers, the way you um, change the lifecycle management, the way you implement the application, and that is essentially the design patterns we have come up with as the Flame Consortium. And those design patterns describe um, the uh, basically the behavior you can have between your IP endpoints, and this includes the clients that attach to the Wi-Fi access points, as well as the communication among service functions. Um, the design patterns are essentially unique platform features which you utilize, and for the open call now and the uh, very short proposal we will ask you to submit, um, you essentially will have the opportunity to take the design patterns you will um, you will be after as part of the proposal. And I I mean to no surprise the more design patterns your service could essentially demonstrate, the more interesting it will be for us to get you funded. Um, we have also done a, um, a dissemination task on developing a so-called guided tour, which is on our Flame website. And there's one PDF that talks um, about all the design patterns. And I just want to go through four very dominant ones um, to give you um, a, a, a flavor of what a design pattern is and what you um, will expect to, um, to talk about in your proposal briefly. So the design patterns I will present here is um, opportunistic multicast, nearest endpoint, a geographical scaling, and a synchronized playout. So in the opportunistic multicast, um, you essentially have a, on the right, you always have a, um, a drawing, the same you will find in design patterns PDF. Um, and in this case here, you have um, two clients, you're connected to two different locations, access points in your case. Um, as you know, you're terminating all your traffic at the edge through so-called service routers, SR. So each SR represents basically a location and the service function endpoint one is serving um, the HTTP segment, in this case is a video delivery. Now, if both clients sending off the same request at roughly the same time, the SR, um, the SR number three is essentially learning that and will send off the response that comes from the service function endpoint one only once to both SRs at the edge, where it gets the that um, gets being sent off to the UE. So the UE is 
just don't see anything what's going on, but you have basically a cost reduction of network load in the core network of 100%. Um, because you only send off one response for two clients instead of two responses. Um, the second one, which is um, well unusual in the uh, way the current internet works, which also, and, and I know from a lot of discussions um, throughout the execution of the project, of your own projects, um, has caused quite a bit of confusion always. That's why um, I deemed it necessary to present here, is essentially the course of what we call the nearest endpoint. So in this scenario here, you have um, UE1 and 2 connected to SR1, same example, and 3, 4 to SR number 2, um, and all those service function endpoints are active. As you know, for HTTP, we are using the name, the FQDN. If all service function endpoints are of the same service function, they all have the same FQDN, and this actually um, allows UE1 and UE2 to be served to be served by SFE1 and 3 and 4 by the one on the very right, which is SFE2. SFE3 is not being used at all um, without any notion in both of your endpoints, the service endpoint and the endpoint. Um, and this what we call nearest endpoint, which is based on the shortest path calculation within the platform. Um, you can easily um, steer traffic based on changing the lifecycle states of service function endpoints. The uh, horizontal scaling is um, one of the, uh, I would say, one of the key benefit when it comes to orchestration patterns. Um, why I'm saying this is because that is something you cannot do on a public cloud. You cannot do an AWS, not in Google, not in Azure, not anywhere. Um, it basically allows you the, to, through measurements, which you see on the right, through the measurement arrow coming from SFE2 into the CMSC, for example, um, SFE2 is enabled, SFE1 is only set to boot it. And so basically four clients going to one single service function endpoint. And if it's like very heavy video loads, if you apply it only with like or provisioned SFE with one core, you might see degradation in QoS. So you send off a trigger saying, please connect SFE1, which essentially is a horizontal scaling out, which means you distribute the computational load required to serve the four end devices um, across locations. And that is what this design pattern is about, which um, we have seen um, in OpenCore 3 quite heavily being used. And I know because those description of design patterns haven't been really available in open call one that is certainly something which we would definitely like to see from anyone who submits from a formal open call one experimenter and the oh sorry wrong window and the last is the synchronized playout that is something um not sure if many of you actually um made use of that but um while you know you can have nearest endpoint and opportunistic multicast as one of these design patterns, you also have a way of enforcing a synchronized playout of all clients. So in this case, um, assume a tourist application where um, all clients using like a VR headset or something to access the same content at the same time, and you have a master that controls when the service is supposed to be started across all clients. Um, so if you do that. Essentially, you a you get openistic multicast in the core network, which allows you actually to have a provisioning of the service, which might not be able in the ordinary internet, assuming that if you have 200 clients, just put a number out there, and they would all access the same content over the internet. You would essentially break the the access network, which um, has a limited bandwidth. So um, a synchronized playout is essentially some application logic which enforces certain design patterns underneath. Um, again, it's described in further detail in the PDF. And that's actually all I wanted to share. So according to the Agenda, I think I'm giving over to 
It is August next. It's August, yes. So we're going to go through um, three replicators, starting with uh, Barcelona. So August from I2K. Okay, thank you. So just a warning for everybody else, you're, you're presenting your own slides, so get them ready on your own computer. Um, yep, be, that's fine. I'm just way. opening them. Can there you see you them? Yeah, full screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, I'm August from I2CAD. Probably some of you already know me from your open call experiments. I just want you to uh, want to give a brief overview of what you have in Barcelona and what you can play with in the test bed that we are operating here together with EMI. So first of all, uh, we have um, a two-tire uh, infrastructure, so with the uh, Metro DC being hosted in in our uh, offices or close to our offices, and on the other end of the city, we have the on-street deployment, which includes the lampos, which have uh, Wi-Fi access points, and also a on-street cabinet that hosts the um, the edge compute node. And um, to give you an idea, so these are the distances. So the, uh, you can deploy uh, services in the um, upper left corner, which is uh, the metro, uh, well, the main DC. And on the uh, lower right uh, end, you have the entire on street deployment. We can zoom in on that. Uh, here is a more or less bird's eye view of the, the street in which we deployed our Wi Fi access, access points and also the on street cabinet. Um, as you can see, we are covering more or less a, um, a range of 300 to 400 meters along the street. And um, we have a total of four up to, so for experiments, you can use a total of up to four lampposts, which are connected each with fiber to the edge cabinet where we have networking equipment and of course our edge compute capacities. Um, so if we look at the at these compute capacities, uh, you can see that in the Manisi we have a cluster for your services, which has 10 virtual CPUs, uh, up to 32 gigabyte of RAM and 200 gigabyte of storage, more or less. And then we have uh, four clusters, one for each lamppost, with a free virtual CPUs each and 17 gigabyte of RAM and 19 gigabyte of storage. Uh, I think the storage can be adapted a bit, um, but the other values are more or less uh, static. So if you design an experiment, that's what you will most probably get. As I said, each, uh, so there is a logical mapping. So each lamppost is mapped to one of those clusters at the edge, which allows you to play with the features that Sebastian mentioned in his in his presentations, like, uh, like the multicast, but also a content that is placed uh, at one cluster, which will be closer to certain users attached to certain lampposts than um, contents that are um, assigned to a different lamppost further away. Um, just to also give you an idea of what we have on the Wi-Fi side, basically we are using 802.11ac. We have uh, with two, two times two MIMO. Um, we have seen like an average uh, data rates of about 50 mbits per second uh, shared among the users, but that varies and it depends a lot on the interferences that we are observing. In any case, we offer to adapt the configuration uh, if you have specific wishes, um, uh, but so far the experimenters have used this default configuration. Okay, um, again, so if, if you get the chance to do an experiment here with us, uh, we uh, we use the common channels of communication that, uh, well, uh, you already have been using for your other open call. And uh, we, for maybe for open call one, it was not not yet active. I don't remember exactly. Uh, okay, we, we, we are now using Teams and also Skype for chatting, especially to coordinate during any live testing and debugging sessions. Um, of course, we are here to help you with any issues you have on the infrastructure side. And uh, also, if we are your mentor, then um, you will get the full support you also have been given during your op call experiment. 
And um, maybe as an important addition, I don't know if this was mentioned, but um, for OpenPol1 experimenters, we have now emulated uh, user equipments, which means that before you do any tests or we go on to the street to do some tests, you can basically test your service function chain with emulated UEs, which are virtual machines that um, be, uh, that are as if they would be attached to the to the Wi-Fi lamppost. This gives you already an opportunity to do some experimentation before going to the uh, to, to to going to use actual user equipment like smartphones or tablets or uh, laptops, which is a nice addition, especially um, yeah for preparing the final trial. Okay. Um, yes. So uh, currently things are looking quite good with COVID-19. We're allowed to go back to the street and uh, even though it progresses slowly, we expect that if everything goes well by the, by the time that you are expecting to conduct your trial, we, we will be able to, to do it uh, as before without any restrictions. Let's cross fingers for that. In any case, this slide, uh, you can see the the basic rules and what you already have been experiencing here in Barcelona. So uh, one uh, one experiment at a time. We have certain uh, hours for the testbed operations, and uh, yeah, we don't expect you to bring any hardware to to the to the street. Uh, it's you, you get what what I just mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, slides, okay. I think um, that's it. Uh, just okay. A final remark for the trial preparation, and that's how we have been doing so far, and it worked quite well. If you need anything else, like tables, power plugs, etc., just contact us in time, and we will be uh, happy to help you out with that and plan the, the trials. Uh, yeah, that's it. Actually, thank you, August. Uh, and that's Welcome. a really good point on the emulated user equipment. We have these deployed as all of the replicators. So uh, as those who are currently in Open Call 3 know, um, we're potentially uh, just going to be conducting technical trials remotely uh, for Open Call 3. Um, and that can be done over VPN from your home or office uh, and setting up clients on emulated user equipment nodes actually uh, in the replicator site. So we can go a long way uh, without involving uh, people being on the street. Though, of course, without the people, you lose a lot of the information on the uh, more qualitative uh, experience aspects, but uh, we do what we can. Um, so over to Bristol now, uh, Navi. Hi, this is Navi um, calling from University of Bristol. Um, I'm going to present to you the Bristol infrastructure that is serving the Flame project. Um, much of the slides will be similar to the ones before. Uh, so there is, so so this depicts the uh, central uh, Bristol city center and the fiber net network that stretches from the university campus uh, across different locations. In this open call four, we are only going to utilize um, the, the Millennium Square as the testing spot, which, which is fiber to the university and, um, and, 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 and um, a straight line would be about 700 meters, but, but, but the fiber network is probably a bit more than that. In previous campaigns, we have used uh, other spots, but in this one, we will, we will focus on the Millennium Square. Um, the the, the 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 flame infrastructure utilizes the the STM fabric uh, with with edge, with hardware edge core switches, uh, which are quite fast. Um, the, the the data center is located at the university. Uh, we have we have got it. We have got a server with 20 uh, virtual CPUs and 132 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and the um, edge servers are actually located in the Millennium Square where the experiments uh, are uh, happen and the computations are, are done at the edge. Um, there's an OpenStack controller and there, and, and there are five compute servers there. There are also five Wi-Fi access points at the square 
where the uh, tests and where the trials and, and, and experiments have, have happened before. And depending on how the lockdown um, allows us, um, experiments can be done also at the Millennium Square. Um, and, 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 and this is a bird's view of the square itself. Dimensions are 70 by 70 uh, meters. There are six towers, but only five of them are going to be used in this campaign. Um, and if it happens that we have to test remotely, then uh, similar to Barcelona, um, there, there will be emulated UEs uh, running on these towers and the experiment can, can be done remotely. Um, each, each of these Wi-Fi access points are radiating their, their, their own unique uh, SSIDs. And based on your requirements, we can switch on or off um, any number of these access points um, to, to serve your purpose. Yeah, we, we, we have to skip this. This is, this is the MSHED site, which is not going to be used in this campaign. Um, a logical, a, 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 a logical diagram of where the service uh, functions and service routers are are located in in in, um, in the servers. So um, the uh, the data center, as I said, is located at the HPN lab at the university, um, and the service routers are in, in the clusters which are at the Millennium Square where the trials happen. And as I said, the distance here between the HPN and, and, and with the curious is, is about a kilometer, more or less. Um, yes, as you, as, as most of you are, are, are aware, to, to, access the, um, to access the infrastructure, we, we would require you to first test your application in Sandbox, Sandpit, et cetera. And then, when you have passed all all these and, and it works, then you will uh, then you will request your VPN credentials. Um, you can email me, and I can supply with you the certificate and credentials. Um, it is it, it, it's quite important to to also test your application on the British infrastructure, um, because there there are slight differences in in in, in the software architecture between Bristol and Sandpit and Sandbox. So, so don't take it for granted that if it works for in Sandpit, it will also work for um, Bristol exactly the same. It needs uh, some tweaking. Um, if, you plan to uh, if, if, if you plan to test your application on Bristol Infra, whether remotely or on site, uh, you, you, you need to book in advance um, both Bristol and, uh, and ID should, should, should be available to, to support you. And we have, we have got a calendar to place these bookings. So, so please contact us beforehand. Um, and if, if the time comes that you will uh, come to Bristol and, and, and test it in the square, we, we need to, uh, University of Bristol has to contact Millennium Square for, to, 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 to book in advance because it's, it's a place where several events happen in the year, and we want to make sure that those events don't clash with your um, trials. And if all these uh, conditions are met, then we would, and also COVID-19 lockdown is uh, lifted, then we would advise you to, 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 to book your tickets. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Naveed. Uh, then finally, for the replicators, we're going to go to uh, Bruschetti Palazzolo, uh, and we got Paolo from level seven. So if you could hand over to him, Navid, uh, then Paolo, you can uh, present your. Okay. So good morning, everybody. I guess I should uh, share the presentation from my screen, right? Or you are going to share yeah, the no, presentation? You, you, you share it, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just let me see uh, how to good. go to full screen. Can you see that? We're not on full screen. 
Okay, just going like full quality. screen, but it's doing strange things because I think it's Stick still with Windows, the, so. Okay, now we're looking at the presenter view. Okay, did it but come? We're seeing the presenter view it's rather than the full slow. screen. Yeah. Perhaps you should just carry on. It's uh, probably good enough. Can you see that? Yeah, it's, it's a bit okay. small, but it's fine. It's fine, I guess. Oh, hey, Paolo, my... you should invert the presentation. There is a, the option display settings on the top of the monitor. Display settings. Okay. There is invert just, presentation. Just let me close the other one so it would be easier. Sorry for this. It, the, this this view um, this view now would be fine. Just just you know, now it's got enormous. Just leave it there. Leave it there. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the the thing with the, this window thing. Um, so regarding the infrastructure in Lucid I don't know if you can see it or uh, it's uh, it's showing as you expect with this thing. Is it working as you would expect? I mean, is is it showing it's fine. everything? Yeah. 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 yeah it's fine. Yeah, okay. Is. Okay. Okay, so um, good morning, uh, no, good afternoon. So um, um, this is the uh, presentation about uh, the infrastructure from level seven. We participated to the second open call as a replicator. Um, the idea beyond uh, our proposal was to show um, the something which was a little bit different from the other two test beds, which are uh, big cities or they are uh, let's say, uh, cities. Um, we have thought that uh, in order to make it different, uh, the, the idea was to make it work in a rural area. So uh, we have different infrastructures, but um, the, the, the idea was, can we think about services in rural areas which are totally different from big cities? So we started with this uh, idea and uh, just to give you uh, an idea where we are located, I mean, where the infrastructure is located is not in a big city, is uh, in, the, in the country. So that we have uh, this uh, community, which is called Buceto Palisola. Buceto Palisola is a very small uh, town, um, which is located in South Italy. And here we have, outdoor and indoor nodes so uh, there is a lot uh, of, of uh, scenarios this is just to give you an idea of the outdoor nodes uh, which are uh, currently um, turning on with the antennas uh, the coverage is a little bit more this is just to give you the idea of the direction so basically we are covering all this area uh, well, it depends on where you are on the device, but more or less you should be covered from, from here to there. So the country, you should have outdoor coverage. Um, this is just uh, the overview of the infrastructure, um, which is right now, which is connected by wireless links. Uh, we are upgrading to fiber. Uh, it should happen in, uh, I guess, one month from today, one month and a half. This depends on when the fiber uh, should be ready. I hope that in six weeks we should be start uh, putting the fiber instead of, of the wireless links. But the nodes are there and they are connected. Um, so we have, as I said, the different scenarios. Uh, some of them are outdoor, some are indoor. Um, but more or less, the Infrastructure is organized as follows. There is always a wireless device, one or more uh, devices, depends on the, on the place. Um, usually there is at least uh, uh, five gigas, so it's five gigas or two gigas. Then there is a lot of things uh, which are not available to the experimenters, like uh, the radio devices, uh, the power devices, and things like that, but usually, for every node, we have a server which is uh, available directly connected to the wireless, to one more wireless devices which are on the on the infrastructure. So um, this is the real edge of the infrastructure, which is made of multiple uh, nodes, which are more or less something like this. 
Um, then, just to give you an idea, we have this kind of um, um, nodes which are located in, um, in, 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 the, in the community. This is, for example, the cultural center, or we call it also the museum, which is an indoor uh, website, indoor site where you can um, connect to the infrastructure. And here we have an indoor access network, which is two gigahertz and five gigahertz. And that one is directly connected to the server, which is uh, 10 meters from the, the access point. Um, so the infrastructure is made of different scenarios. I will list uh, more, I will give more detail also in the, in the wiki because there are different uh, uh, places and different uh, possibilities to run the experiment indoor or outdoor. Um, but here you, can see the list of the hardware which is in place, uh, which is um, mostly 24 CPUs for uh, the nodes, uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and at least uh, um, 400 uh, gigabytes uh, SSD, or in some cases, 900 gigabytes. Um, the list is, uh, this is just a reference, the updated list is always present on the GitLab, on the wiki, on the uh, infrastructure page, and all the devices that are there. Each device has a unique SSID so that you can know where you are connected, if you want to connect to another device or something like that. Just a note about um, the school, because um, due to the COVID restriction, the school is closed. It has been closed since the end of February, and it will stay closed till the, I think, end of September or mid-September. So my advice is to not do not consider the school as a possible indoor scenario. Um, however, if you really need to do that in a school, we can ask to open the school for us, but obviously there will be nobody there. So I don't know how it's useful to have an empty uh, place to, to, to run an experiment. Um, regarding the nodes, um, we also have uh, one specific node, so it's like having two infrastructures. One, the real infrastructure is in Buseto Palizzolo, but the main data center is in Palermo, so the idea was to put another node in Palermo. So the node in Palermo is exactly the same type of hardware that you will find in, uh, in Buseto Palizzolo, so it's a real node. Uh, I mean, it's a node with uh, two access points, one dedicated hardware, and you can run your experiments there. So uh, you can run, the process is always the same, uh, do your development in the flame in the box, then in the, in the sand pit. But um, also we have another possibility to run the experiment, I mean some small technical trials in our offices, which is uh, just to speed up the things and uh, uh, not to go directly there, at least we can help you directly from our offices. And then to think about the trial or some uh, sort of experiment that you really want to run in the real infrastructure. This depends on the capabilities of your experiment, what you really need, if you need indoor, outdoor, uh, if you need uh, multiple access points or specific places or something like that. Regarding the node that we have in Palermo here is exactly as the other nodes. It has uh, 24 vCPUs. Uh, 30, 32 gigabytes RAM. I think it's uh, more or less 400 uh, gigabytes of uh, hard drives. So it's uh, it's ready there and it's connected to two access points so you can run uh, the experiment uh, uh, also there. Some notes about the logistics. As you know, we are under COVID. So um, right now, we can travel, we can go to Buseto Polizzolo, to the place. Um, right now, also Italian people can go to Buseto Polizzolo. I mean, you can do interregional travels. I don't know if the situation is going to be better or worse, nobody knows, but uh, probably from June, I guess you can also think about doing some trials and we can organize, we can help you also with real users. But, uh, the thing is that uh, many local events uh, that were organized during the, the summer are being cancelled due to the COVID uh, problem uh, or put on hold. So 
uh, maybe we can organize only small trials with five uh, five users or something like that, and not not big uh, events or big trials that we were expecting at the beginning, uh, because uh, for national and regional um, regulations we can we don't know if we can do that uh, from from today to September. Uh, nobody knows how the the rules will be. So this is just a small presentation about the infrastructure. More information will be uh, on the on the wiki, or you can send me an email if you really have a specific question about some needs, or if you need some coverage, or you need something for your experiment. Uh, just uh, send me an email. I will try to ask you in the, in the in the best way. Thank you very much, Paolo. So. Um... We, uh, we now move on to uh, some information about the process we're going to follow uh, from Lamprini from Motto. So uh, if you can hand over to her, Paolo. Uh, yes, I will she... stop sharing. Sure. So she's at the top of the list. There we go. Yeah, you got it. I suppose she grabbed it herself. Off you go. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I hope that you can see my screen. Let me. Pull. Uh, yeah, you're not full screen yet, but now, now, you're, okay. now you're on the presenter view. Yeah. Usual problem. Again. <laughs> <laughs> so you can swap displays. There's a swap displays button at the top there. That might uh, do it. Third button along at the top. Swap displays. This one. Wait. The one that says swap now you displays. Can see the, full the, third, the, the third, the third button along at the top. There we go. Yep. Swap, swap. I think no. Now I did the opposite. It was fine, and now it's not. Yep. Now it's good. fine. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So this will be really short. Hi, everybody. Uh, actually, the, the process for the fourth open call is more or less the same as the, the previous ones. Uh, the, the step that we miss here is a feasibility check. We don't have uh, this step and the valuation is an internal one. Um, that means that it will be the, the proposals will be evaluated by a committee from, uh, from the partners. Uh, this table here presents uh, what is already in the info document that you that you are aware of, including the basic information about the number of the trials and uh, the projects that we will fund and the respective uh, budget. So in this open call, we tend to fund uh, one uh, third-party project extension of uh, the third-party projects for uh, replicators and uh, three for, uh, for the trials, for the experimentation. So we will have uh, for the replicators, um, the proposal should be in the original cities as uh, they, they were in the, in the previous calls from the, new, from the open call two. And for the experiments, uh, it could be in any of the three cities of Barcelona, Bristol and uh, Buceto Palizzolo. And uh, here all the SME trials and industry trials from the open call one, two and three uh, can submit uh, a proposal. So the rules are more or less uh, the same, not more or less, it's exactly the same. Again, you have to provide all the uh, information in English using the template that we have in the website, and you have to use uh, the usual uh, URL and form in order to, to, to submit your, uh, your proposals. Uh, we don't have here two steps, draft and finals. We have only one, uh, one phase of, uh, of submission uh, because we missed this feasibility check. Here I have uh, actually the questions and answers that are already provided uh, by Stephen to all of you, I guess. But I just put the slide here, so uh, maybe somebody, someone is not aware of about that. So uh, about uh, the new experiments, if they can be in uh, the same city as before, no. As we said before, it can be in any of the three cities, um, uh, Bristol, Barcelona and Sicily. And uh, about this COVID-19 uh, situation, 
uh, here, as Stephen indicates, the KPIs and experiments can demonstrate the benefits that we are looking for for the uh, Flame platform based on the trials that you were, are going to design, and how novel these uh, proposals uh, needs to be. Uh, we don't expect to uh, to create some uh, uh, to create magic out of the projects right now. Uh, it's only extension of the trials and the activities that you that you've done uh, that you've done before. About the deadlines. Uh, so in four days, uh, end of May is the submission uh, deadline. Then up to the 10th of June, you will have a notification about the results after the evaluation is complete, and uh, the starting date of the uh, of the proposal of the project should be really soon, which means in uh, 15th uh, 15th of June, uh, the latest. So you will have some time up to end of September in order to. Um, to implement all the trials and all the uh, activities that you plan in your um, in your projects. So again, the evaluation here will be simplified using only three criteria from the full list that we had from the previous uh, calls: examining the clarity methodology, use of service design patterns, and demonstration potential. And of course, this is uh, this is reflected also to the template of the proposals that we are expecting to receive from your side. Uh, this is uh, this is a short one. Um, we expect that no more than two pages will be uh, the full proposal that uh, that you will be submit. Uh, that's all about the um, uh, the process. So thank you and good luck. And uh, I think that we have some time now for any questions. Yeah. So uh, we've got quite a few people from the consortium on the call to help answer any questions. Um, I should just say, in case it wasn't obvious, uh, but especially for those people coming back to the project after a, a break away, please do check our website for the latest deliverables and blog posts, uh, explanations of our DevOps pipeline, for instance, that helps you get going very quickly. And um, we're expecting to be able to publish um, two deliverables, D5.5, and 5.8 in the next couple of days, which uh, have information about um, analyzing previous experiments and more information about the infrastructures, which may give you a little bit more background that you uh, find useful. So keep a lookout for those on the website um, and have a poke around. Any questions from anybody? We've got, we've got a few people here to answer them and some time. So please shout out if you've got something to ask. Yeah, hi, George here. Yeah, I have a question. I hope you can hear me all well. Yeah, hi, hi George. Nice to hear you. Nice to see you, yes. Nice, nice to hear you. Well, a question is for Paolo, basically, because he mentioned this uh, uh, two different um, uh, areas of indoor and outdoor. And my question is basically if we can combine a, a use case uh, indoor and outdoor. So basically from, um, let's say, an indoor side, you, you have access to let's say, infrastructure and services that are running on the outdoor. OK, so um, the infrastructure in Buceto Palizzolo is a unique infrastructure. So uh, from the technical point of view, it's exactly one infrastructure. Um, you can think about a nomadic, uh, let's say a nomadic use case, like you connect in some place and then you reconnect in another place. For outdoor places, uh, there is no need to, to, to ask for permissions because it's in the outdoor, in the square, so it's a, it's a public place. For indoor places, obviously we have to organize with, uh, for example, the museum, if you want to go to the museum, or if you want to go to the, um, uh, to the to the municipality uh, usually those places in the past were open to the public right now there is this covid situation so we have to organize but from the technical point of view is exactly the same infrastructure what you have to do is you connect to the right uh, ssid 
uh, because in some places you can get multiple SSIDs. So you just, uh, if you want to connect to one or the other or the best that you think is best for you, you check, you can just uh, go there and it's exactly the same infrastructure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in, in the same, in the same, in all three replicators that we're offering, uh, the, the various nodes are linked together by, uh, by high performance networks. So you can deploy across them. The advantage of uh, Busetto is, uh, well, the, the difference of Busetto is that the, the nodes are wide, wider spaced out yep. than uh, in, the, in the other two sites. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Alex and, and the colleague of, uh, of George, and I have a follow-up question to this. Um, and uh, just for clarification, it was mentioned that there are emulated user equipment that are available at all replicators. This is also the case um, um, uh, there in um, uh, Busetto, right? So can we use in Busetto also emulated user equipment uh, to carry out before uh, field trials, basically, to, to carry out uh, replica experiments? Um, Paolo or Sebastian? Can you clarify? I think the the best guy is Sebastian to answer this one. I I, I, I think in I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what we got planned there, Sebastian. Sorry, there You're was a second button to unmute myself. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Short, short short answer, yes. Yeah, that's okay. what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Anyone else apart from in two? <laughs> and does anyone from the consortium have any other points uh, to make that have uh, occurred to them during the call? Any further information we might want to mention? Um, hi, this is August again from Barcelona. So basically what we thought would be helpful for experimenters that still haven't been here in Barcelona. Uh, maybe we can try to provide some on-street on footage, like recording a video or something, so they get an idea of the dimensions and the layout. Um, uh, we think that could be valuable. So uh, we are evaluating if we can do such a video with together with Imi. We would share it in case uh, we can manage to do, to do that. Yeah, that would be great. So uh, just put it up somewhere and send an email to the three mailing lists uh, if you're able to do that. Obviously, um, Google, will, Street, Google, Street, Google Street View is your friend as well. Anyone else? That's true. Uh, yes, this is again Paolo from Level 7. For the Busetto Palit Solo testbed, we have uh, taken different photos. So just to uh, give you an idea of, of the places, because obviously most of the work is not just uh, from the technical point of view, like uh, what is this kind of access point, but also on the places. So just to give you an idea, we are collecting the photos and uh, maybe by the end of this week, you should have uh, some updates on the wiki, uh, just to understand what you can do, how big uh, is the square or something like that, so. Yeah, thanks, Paolo. I'm just trying to remember um, I'm just trying to think what the best place to put this sort of resource is. Um, I'm trying to remember if everyone from Open Core 1 and 2 still has access to our internal systems or whether we uh, whether we deactivated that. Um, let me look into that and we'll, we'll work out where best to put additional resources for you all. Okay. Well, we're coming up to uh, the hour, which I guess we assumed we'd be using. Any questions? Do we have an email address uh, that we need for people to email questions in the in the short period that we've got to make this proposal? Is that on the um, is that on the website? Yeah, there is an address in the info document that uh, that people can yeah. use in order to address yeah any question or yeah. 
So uh, it's, it's, yeah, you can find it on the website and in the information document. So if you do have further questions, don't hesitate to get in touch and we'll do our best. And if we're able to pull together some resources about some um, photographs and videos, we'll be sure to send them round and make sure they're accessible to you. Um, and otherwise, I'm sure we'd all like to wish you the best of luck and look forward to uh, seeing what interesting extensions to your uh, previous work uh, you can come up with. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll, we'll leave it there.